Last week during the Twilight video, I mentioned that I hadn't seen a lot of movies that pretty much raised my generation and the generation prior to mine. Well, in that list of movies, I completely forgot to mention this one. I have never seen High School Musical. Truthfully, I've just never had a strong desire to see the movie, so I never went out of my way to do it. But I've gotten a lot of comments saying to review it, so I figured it was finally time to bite the bullet and do that. High School Musical is probably Disney Channel's most profitable franchise. It wouldn't even be a huge stretch to say that because it's one of Disney Channel's only franchises to make it off of the channel and into theaters, with the third one actually coming out in theaters and making over 250 million dollars. But even after this movie's initial release on January 20th, 2006, it went on to make an absurd amount of money in home releases and DVD sales. Nice. It's estimated that High School Musical sold 1.2 million DVD copies within the first week. For those of you who are too young to remember when physical sales was the main way to watch movies at home, selling 1.2 million copies of anything was bonkers. You'd have an easier time electing a black president. Although the reviews for the movie are pretty middling from both now and then, most of the 7.7 .7 million people who watched the movie were pretty okay with the product they got. So with numbers like that, it's not surprising that this movie got more spin-offs and sequels than any movie has ever required. I mean, f we got a TV show for this movie four years ago, and it's still airing to this day. I actually just found that out. I thought this show ended years ago. But I'm a contrarian, and I want to figure out what all the hype is about and decide whether or not this movie is any good at all. I refuse to be persuaded by Zac Efron's luscious locks and Vanessa Hudgens' silky smooth voice. I will decide once and for all whether this movie is based or cringe. <laughs> You're cringe! Our movie opens up on a snowy New Year's Eve in an undisclosed location. I actually couldn't dig up a location for this place, and by that I mean it wasn't on the first page of Google. The first character we're introduced to is Troy, played by Zac Efron. He's living proof that white man can't jump, but they sure can sing. Next is Gabriella Montez, played by Vanessa Hudgens. She's an introverted bookworm who really doesn't want to be at the New Year's Eve party our main characters are currently attending. Though both of our main characters pretty quickly open up to each other when friends and family alike force them to perform a romantic duet. This is the first song in the movie titled Start of Something New. It's a good song, but it certainly sounds like it came from the long lost year of 2006. I also do think it's pretty funny that on Spotify it says the song is created by Gabriela Montez and Troy. Like, I think it's a fun little jokey joke, but it makes more sense on the part of Troy than it does Gabriela Montez. The reason it makes more sense for Troy is because Zac Efron doesn't actually perform any of the songs by himself. His voice was digitally mixed with someone named Drew Seeley to get the Troy voice that we all know and love today. So Troy is more like a moniker for these two, but Vanessa Hudgens did actually sing all of her songs herself. In fact, when she has a solo later in the movie, she'll be credited by her actual name. I don't know why this is the one specific incidence of this, but other than that, all of the other characters are listed by their in-universe names and not their actors' names. Wow, that really was a long tangent about something that's not related to the plot, so let's get back to the important stuff. You know, I don't really think I care that our main characters are secretly good singers. I do think it's very possible that you could get two random people to perform karaoke and they just happen to have perfect pitch. What I find more odd is the unnatural chemistry that these two have. These two are giving a straight up performance right now. This is a borderline concert. I would probably pay 10 to $12 to see this in person. After the song is over, Troy and Gabriella get to know each other some more, exchange contact info, and then we're transported to the titular Musical High School, a school that is heavily composed of groups and cliques such as Sport Enjoyer and Judgmental Bystander. And wouldn't you know it, today is Gabriella's first day at High School Musical. Yes, I am aware that it's just called East High, but I'm calling it High School Musical because I like to add a little bit of whimsy to the movies I review. Our characters head to Homeroom, where we meet quite a few important characters. First is the Homeroom teacher, Mrs. Darbus played by Allison Reed. It's not surprising that she's unmarried because she's literally the worst person that you've ever f***ing met. Mr. Danforth, this is a place of learning, not a hockey arena. Fun fact, this is actually a basketball. Second is Chad, played by Corbin Blue. Chad is the best friend of Troy and is also a member of Music High School's basketball team. He's a pretty okay character, I guess, but he reminds me of the kids who would call me homophobic slurs in high school. And lastly is Sharpay, played by Ashley Tisdale. Sharpay is the classic high school queen bee type character, 
or at least she thinks she is, because no one really gives her the time of day or respect that that title typically entails. Troy thinks that he sees Gabriella walk by and is surprised at her presence. In an effort to figure out whether or not this is her, he calls her phone to see if it rings. The sound of cell phones ringing greatly pisses off Mrs. Darbus, and she gives Gabriella and Troy detention after school that day. I wasn't lying when I said Mrs. Darbus f sucks. Gabriella was actively in the process of silencing her cell phone, but she still got detention just for having it out at all. Mrs. Darbus then takes their phones, which is a thing that teachers are allowed to do, but then she takes them for the rest of the day, which teachers aren't allowed to do. Like, you wouldn't catch me dead leaving my cell phone with this woman. Troy catches up with Gabriella and learns that she's attending high music school because her mother got a job in the great city of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Trust me, it's taking everything in me not to make a Breaking Bad joke right now, but we're two years too early. Though if Brian Cranston has a cameo in this movie, all bets are off and I will be making the most annoying Wojak Pog face you have ever seen. In our next scene, we get a song called Get Your Head in the Game, where we get to focus on the internal struggle that Troy is currently having. He can't decide if he wants to play basketball or give in to his homosexual urges. And by that I mean sing. Realistically, he could just do both. But I think he's scared his squad mates will call him a homophobic slur if he joins a play. Guys, I gotta be so brutally honest with you. This is one of the worst songs I've ever heard. I do not care for the beat switch that happens in the song, and the beat that plays for most of the song is just not very fun to listen to. The audio mixing is also garbage, and the lyrics are just not very good. I f with like the first 25 seconds of this, and then it just loses me after the first chorus. Though isn't it also a little ironic that this musical number happens immediately after Chad tells Troy that singing is for bubble blow and double babies? Like I get it's a musical, but that's still kind of an odd choice, right? Our next scene is our first interaction between Sharpay and Gabriella. Sharpay is trying to grill Gabriella for more information on why Troy seems to be ignoring her when it's literally snow bunny season but Gabriella is thoroughly uninterested. This scene mostly just serves to show us how intelligent Gabriella is, being so smart that she consistently corrects her own teachers. Wait, this teacher is pregnant? That's weird, I thought only English teachers could be in third trimester during the first two weeks of school. Either way, in two weeks, she'll be on maternity leave for the rest of the semester because the school year just started. This is a bit of an unrelated tangent, but do teachers do this intentionally? I swear, so often, my teachers in middle school would get pregnant right as the school year started, and then they'd only be there for like three weeks at the start or end of the semester. And like, that's fine. I respect any method it takes to get free money from the government and also not have to work. It just happens so consistently that I'm beginning to believe that there's a certain week in December where these teachers are just like, okay, honey, it's time to f Our next character is Ryan Evans, played by Lucas Grable. Ryan is the fraternal twin to Sharpay. If Sharpay was in the Queen Bee, he would be. Ryan noticed that Troy was looking at the audition board and took it as a slight against himself and Sharpay. Sharpay f hates Gabriella because she's smart and she once also glanced in the general direction of the bulletin board. So in the next scene, Ryan and Sharpay do a creepy amount of research on Gabriella and begin a plan to sabotage her high school career. And by sabotaging her high school career, I mean probably doing the best thing that they could possibly do for her, and they sign her up for the Scholastic Decathlon. Because I guess Sharpay isn't a total dick. She just really wants to be the main character in this play. This is Taylor, the captain of School of Musicals Scholastic Decathlon team, who also has detention, I guess? Either that or she signed up for Drama Club, while also being the leader of the decathlon team, but considering the movie never gives us any indication of that, it's more likely than not the former. Detention for Mrs. Darbus is basically just how the American prison system works. She basically finds any small excuse to send these people to detention and then makes them all do busy work for like a couple hours. Except she doesn't discriminate by race, so gold star for you Mrs. D, you're already more progressive than 94% of America. Don't be too proud of yourself though, it's, a, it's still a pretty low bar. But back to what we were talking about, why doesn't Gabriella just decline the offer? I mean, she does, that's literally the first and only thing she does, but why does this put her in a different spot than before? Gabriella doesn't even have an interest in the musical at this point. The reason she declined the decathlon team and also can't do a play is because she's too busy adjusting to the new curriculum of a new state. So she's literally a non-issue for Sharpay at this point. I'm getting a feeling that Sharpay is just digging her own grave. Had Sharpay never done this, Gabriella's plotline probably would have stopped after the opening scene. This is the basketball team coach, Jack Bolton, played by Bart Johnson. He's reasonably pissed that Miss Darbus gave Chad and Troy detention when they need to be practicing for the big game in two weeks. 
the semester just started. I'm pretty sure any game that could be considered big would be much closer to the end of a semester. They should have just said the first game of the season is in two weeks, but I guess they just needed to drive up the stakes for the third act climax to be a lot higher than they actually are. Another reason the stakes are supposed to be high is because they're up against the team that School Music High has lost the championships to for the last three years. Firstly, skill issue. Secondly, doesn't having championships immediately after Christmas break seem like a bit of a bad idea? Very few, if any, of your players are going to be in condition to compete after they've just finished stuffing themselves like a- You don't even know what the simile I was about to make was. Okay, fine. In class the next day, we learn that musical additions are that afternoon. But it's hard to pay attention to that with all those romantic tension in the air. And Troy decides that he's going to audition for the theater behind Chad's back so that he doesn't get made fun of. This is much more effort than any singular human should go through to perform in a play that they don't even know the name of yet. I get why he's hiding from the basketball team, but why is he hiding from the people that he will literally be auditioning in front of? Auditions begin and it's very clear that Troy Thundercock doesn't have any real competition. I mean, this guy... Uh, I... I don't think he's in the right place. The girl playing the piano is Kelsey Nielsen, played by Alessa Rulin. I'm now remembering I've actually seen a very small amount of this movie and she's the only part of it I remember because I had a sizable crush on her when I was like 11. She's of minor significance to the plot, but she's the composer of the play. So you're the one who made it be called Twinkle Town. That's like the less interesting version of La La Land. Gabriella runs into Troy, who has been hiding behind the janitor's cart for literally four minutes, and they discussed wanting to try out for the play, but how they both have their reservations. However, we get our next song here, performed by Sharpay and Ryan, titled What I've Been Looking For. It's clearly written as a romantic show tune duet. Wait a second, they're siblings! Kelsey specifically states that the song was written as a slow romantic duet, and they do their best to make it sound a lot more friendly the way they perform it, but the lyrics still more than a imply that this is a song about two people who want to bone each other. Though Sharpay gets pretty f***ing peeved off when Kelsey tries to interject and tell her as much. But just as the last second, Gabrielle offers to audition and Troy offers to audition with her. But they just miss their window to audition and Mrs. D takes her leave. Though Kelsey plays the duet in the way that it's intended to be heard in the reprise of What I've Been Looking For. Once again, still a very good song, but it's not something you just turn on and listen to. It's very much designed to fit this one specific part of this one specific movie to move the plot forward. This is fine, but I feel like dissecting this song isn't going to be fun for anybody if I just bitch about a song that's here to literally only serve a purpose. Mrs. Darbus overhears Troy and Gabriella going ham on the duet and immediately gives them a callback. Uh, I'm pretty sure they need to like leave the room for it to be considered a callback. This is more like a, a call stay, if you will. I mean, it's not even really like a, it's not even really a call either. It's more like a, more like a yell stay. She like yells across the room. Uh, either way, Troy and Gabriella get callbacks for Thursday with Sharpay and Ryan, who also have callbacks for the same day. And this makes Sharpay royally pissed. And you can tell that Chad is definitely trying to figure out what to say without getting himself canceled. This scene is our next song called Stick to the Status Quo, which is exactly what it sounds like. People tell their respective groups about things that they like doing outside of their group, but they are immediately shut down by their friends. This guy tells them that he likes to bake and they all call him a queer. This girl tells her friends that she likes things as much as hip hop, as much as she likes studying. And they immediately accuse her of being RCTA. And Shaggy here tells all of his friends that he secretly likes to play the cello. And all of his friends tell him that cello killed all of their parents. These guys really wake up and hate on an entirely different level. Like the minute one of them say they have an interest, they all immediately tell them to shut the f up. What do you mean you're enjoying playing Minecraft? You have soccer practice tomorrow. Kill yourself, loser. The song is a banger though. Chad lays into Troy after the song ends. He gets super pissed at the fact that Troy has started a wave of people sharing their niche interests and mingling outside of their friend group. Nobody tell this dude what eugenics is. If he figured it out, he would be petitioning for it every day. Chad tells Troy that he can either play basketball or be a pretty little singer boy, and he leaves the conversation. You know what? 
Okay, Miss Darbait is hot without the glasses. Yeah, yeah, sue me, f**k off. I know a gilf when I see a gilf. Come at me, I don't care. Gabriella gets a note from Troy to meet him at the school's botanical garden, where he relays his stresses about being the basketball guy. He doesn't want to just be the guy that plays with balls. He wants to be the guy that plays and plays. But Gabriella tells him that just because he plays and plays doesn't mean he can't still play with balls, and they decide they'll do the callback together. How heartwarming. There's a montage after the scene where Troy and Gabriella practice for their callback in a private room because they don't want to get gang stomped by everyone in school for singing and having a secondary hobby at the same time. It's also highlighted that Troy is missing out on basketball practice quite frequently just to go to a drama club and sing in private. I think we're supposed to feel bad for him because he's trying and failing to do both, but you have to remember that he's the captain of the basketball team. It is genuinely his responsibility to be there. He can do drama afterward. Like, I want him to be in the play, but guys, Troy is literally just not doing his job right now. Gabriella comes to see Troy, but just before they can start getting into it, he gets cock-blocked by his father showing up. After Gabriella leaves, Coach Bolton gets pissed at Troy for having an interest in singing. He also blames Gabriella for being the reason that Troy is so unfocused, which I guess is like true by proxy. But by that same logic, you can blame this whole thing on the fact that Troy went to the New Year's Eve party and found his passion for singing there. The next day, Chad meets up with Taylor and the decathlon team and plots to save Gabriella and Troy from themselves. Sharpay and Ryan see these two groups talking and assume that they're working together to become the most popular group in school. Once again, the school doesn't really seem to have a real hierarchy of power. We haven't even seen Sharpay enforce her power on anyone outside of Kelsey. Along with that, aren't Taylor and Chad just being really shitty friends right now? Troy says he wants to perform in one singular musical and Chad's whole world falls apart. I'm starting to think that Chad cares about Troy in a much deeper way than he's putting on. Most of the reason I'm actually pissed about Chad trying to get Troy out of the musical is because Chad's logic for it is, is sh he doesn't say, don't do the musical because you need to focus on practice. He says, don't do the musical because straight men don't sing. Disregarding that, the next morning, Chad and Troy begin preparations for their plot against Troy and Gabriella's happiness. Chad's plan for Troy is to hold a f***ing intervention. Guys, he's taking up theater, not methamphetamines. It's f***ing fine. They even bring up the fact that his dad was once champion, and he can't also be champion if he's too busy playing Peter Pan and having sex with other men. Wait, isn't this the dude who was excited about baking like three scenes ago? Damn, they really took his ass to the sunken place, didn't they? Taylor's plan for Gabriella is to convince Gabriella that she's mentally superior to Troy. She tries to convince Gabriella that she's better than Troy because her GPA is higher and that she's on the right side of evolution. That's gotta be problematic in some way, but I can't exactly figure out why. Wait, so let me get this straight. Chad's plan is to convince Troy that he can only ever be good at one thing, and Taylor's plan is to give Gabriella a god complex. You two are terrible people, and I honestly very much despise you right now. Calling it now though, Chad and Taylor definitely get together after the third act climax, both because they're terrible people and because they're both black. The worst part of this whole interaction is that it works. Troy ends up telling the basketball team that Gabriella and singing don't mean anything to him, and everything Troy is saying is being live streamed to Gabriella at the same time. Like this nigga had time to set up a whole ass webcam and he didn't even notice because he was too busy degrading the only woman who ever made him happy. What further pisses me off is that Troy says he was only singing as a way to blow off steam. Like guys, that's a good thing. Niggas aren't allowed to have positive outlets for their emotions anymore? Man, 2006 really was a different time, huh? And what makes all of this even worse yeah, I know it's a pretty f***ed up three minutes of the movie, but this is the last thing I swear, is that Taylor still has the audacity to ask Gabriella if she wants to join the decathlon team. You just broke her f***ing heart, you limp dick drill bit. Why would you ask her that now? Then when she doesn't respond, she asks her to lunch, which she also doesn't respond to. Gabriella just lost everyone she thought she could trust, and she gets nothing out of it. I mean, at least Troy still has the basketball team, but Gabriella just has, I don't know, her TI-82? To make it all even better, she then has to watch Troy be publicly praised for her decision to ignore Gabriella. She then breaks into the sixth song of the movie, titled When There Was Me and You, where Gabriella wrestles with the fact that Troy just treated her like I treat Wendy's. It's always an option, but it's never the answer. I know that this is like the Disney Channel musical, but I mean, goddamn, the music in this movie is just musical themed. There's no real flair to any of these songs in my opinion. Don't get me wrong, they are by no means bad. I still understand that these are good songs, 
but if I were choosing a movie to watch based on the music alone, I would probably choose Descendants over this. After the song, Troy catches up with Gabriella to talk to her about the callback, because unsurprisingly, he was lying to his friends earlier just to hype them up and make them think that he actually gave a f But before he can even explain that to Gabriella, she says she understands that he hates singing and her, and that she doesn't want to do the play anymore. This severely throws him off, and it's fair to say that he didn't get his head in the game. I don't think that this is Troy being bad at basketball though, I think that this is Zac Efron genuinely trying his best to be good at basketball. The next day, Gabrielle and Troy can't even talk to each other, and Taylor and Chad realize that f***ing with their friend's emotions f***ed with their friend's emotions. What? You mean splitting up the perfectly happy couple put them into a bout of depression? Uh, oh my god, what? So they realize that they have to make things right between Gabriella and Troy. Troy's clique tries to come and cheer him up, but when that doesn't work, they have no choice but to come clean about what they did. Taylor does the same thing with Gabriella, but she's reasonably dejected and simply goes back to... I, I don't know, I'm not smart enough to understand what any of this shit is. Troy goes to see Gabriella that night and is met by Gabriella's mother, Milf Montez. That's what I, that's what I said. <laughs> Miss Montez tells Troy that Gabrielle is busy, but because he's feeling a little silly, he decides to commit trespassing and sneak into her backyard. He calls Gabrielle and does a little snooping around their backyard, and well, that's normal and not creepy at all, and he's singing. Can you imagine if this happened in real life? The person you're more upset at than anyone else in the world at the current moment shows up, climbs your house's scaffolding, and starts serenading you outside of your bedroom in the middle of the night? I'm sorry, but that is the quickest 911 call I have ever made. It seems that a little bit of play was all Troy needed to get him back in the game. And even Gabriella is... Well, I still don't know what she's doing, but she's not depressed anymore, so I guess a little bit of white boy does a lot of wonders. But the best part of it all is that they no longer have to snoop around to practice for their callbacks. Oh hey, Ryan and Sharpay are back. I'm not gonna lie, I forgot they existed since they have done nothing of significance in 40 minutes. The last thing that they did in the movie that influenced the plot was singing the duet, and that happened at the 33 minute mark. We are now 74 minutes into this movie. Sharpay gets right back to being the second worst person in this universe and thinks up a plan to sabotage Troy and Gabriella. So her new plan is to get all the events moved to the same day. Doing this is super easy and barely an inconvenience, because Sharpay is actually the co-president of the theater club and she pushes callbacks to Friday to make it easier for everyone. Or at least that's the excuse that she gives to Miss Darbus and that somehow works. I am not kidding you when I say that this scene lasts 17 seconds. If that isn't plot convenience, I do not know what is. The fact that Mrs. Darbus doesn't even question this is also so wild to me, because the only other people getting called back for the main roles are Troy and Gabriella, and Ms. Darbus is well aware that they have prior engagements. So who exactly does she think that this would benefit? The next day, everyone gets the news that callbacks have been changed due to the work of Sharpay and Ryan. But it doesn't deter anyone, as the day after that, Troy has a plan to get Gabriella to the decathlon and get himself to the basketball game, while still making it to callbacks at the same time. But he'll need the help of everyone. This is where we get the titular song, We're All In This Together. Really? I don't know, it just seems like like they, they did that, the all in hand thing, I just, I just thought that... Oh, okay. So after school lets out, their big plan begins. But before that, we cut to a commercial break. Or what feels like a commercial break, because Troy's dad finally gives a goddamn pep talk to his son. You know, f off, you're still a sh dad. In the last scene you were in, you were telling him you didn't like his girlfriend because she was distracting him from basketball. You owe him an apology, not a pep talk, you dick. This is our next and seventh song in the movie titled Bop to the Top. I think it's a joke song, so I'm not gonna rate it. I do f with the chorus, but I don't think you're supposed to take this song too seriously. They don't even play the full thing at once, it's split up across 4 minutes of the movie, and the full version of the song is only a minute and 47 seconds long. Once again, the song isn't bad, but if your doctor tells you that you only have a minute and 47 seconds left to live, you'd probably be better off playing the first half of Gangnam Style. Oh yeah. <laughs> High key, low key. What are you doing here? Waiting for them to play Gangnam Style. Both the big game and the decathlon begin, and to get the Wildcats out of the gym, Taylor and Gabriella cause a power outage in the gym. Okay, well that's definitely illegal, but whatever it takes to get Troy to theater practice, I guess. Are they even allowed to have a laptop out during the middle of a decathlon event? I can't keep my own phone out for a Spanish test, but you're allowed to have a laptop out for a f decathlon? I <laughs> carumba, am I right, guys? <laughs> 
To get the decathlon students out of the room, someone mixes some volatile chemicals to make a concoction that smells so bad that they have to clear out the room. Okay, so you're telling me that rather than just not do the play or explain their situations to Mrs. D, they'd rather commit chemical warfare and illegally sabotage a power grid. You guys are f***ed in the head, you know that? Twinkle Town doesn't need you that bad. Mrs. Darbus almost decides to not give them the opportunity to sing since they aren't there when she initially calls their name, which makes Kelsey run off. And this looks hilarious, by the way. Did she shrink like two feet or something from the last time we saw her? Why does she look so comically short all of a sudden? Mrs. Darbus does change her mind, however, when all of the decathlon and basketball game attendees show up and Kelsey essentially tells Sharpay to f*** off. I mean, say what you want about Mrs. Darbus, but real recognize is real, and they are both incredibly real for that. This is entirely unrelated, but it's been pissing me off. But Sharpay and Ryan are always getting fully dressed up. Firstly, this was auditions, and this is callbacks, not dress rehearsals. You're not gonna get the part because you have a sparkly blue dress, you uncoated frying pan. Gabriella initially freezes because she gets stage fright, but after everyone's favorite white boy gives her a little pep talk, we get our eighth song in the movie titled Break Free. The song is good, I can see why it's the most listened to song of the album, but I can't get past how goddamn extra this is. I've said it before, but this is just callbacks, not a goddamn concert. I mean, I'm glad you two are having a good time, but how do you guys even know the choreography this number? All you have is sheet music, we've seen it on three separate occasions. I doubt you need me to tell you this, but they did get the part. And after that, we cut straight back to the Wildcats, winning the entire basketball game. I'm not shitting you exaggerating, exactly 22 seconds after their musical number finishes, Troy scores a buzzer beater and they win. The championships? Wait, what? Once again, when did they have time for this? It's not stated that they've even played a single game this year. This was championships? You have to remember that this is the beginning of the semester. We know this because New Year's break was like a week ago. Okay, I'm getting entirely too caught up on that. Gabriella comes back to the gym and says that the decathlon team also won. Wow, they really gave her second fiddle. They didn't even bother showing her winning. Chad asks out Taylor, which I called, and Sharpay also comes to an agreement with Gabriella. Kelsey also gets the game ball because, I don't know, they need to make her important for some reason. Also, why did this guy take her hat off to make her shoot the ball? Who is this guy? I also think it's still really annoying that Disney loves to do this nerdy girl is really hot when you put her hair down thing. Alyssa Rulin is a very attractive woman. The only reason she's not attractive in this movie is because she aged somewhat poorly and she looks like she's 14 even though she was 20 at the time. Is it time now? <laughs> Yay! This is the last song of the movie, titled All In This Together. This is the original, hey the movie's over, we can all be friends now, song. It's a good song and a really hype way to end the movie, but you got me f***ed up if you think for a second that I give a quarter pound sh about Sharpay and Ryan. They both did their very best to be terrible people until the very end of the movie. But after a little gag with Mrs. D that's mostly covered by credits, and a quick little end credit gag where Sharpay gets obsessed with Zeke Spake's good, which is admittedly really cute, the movie is over. Wait, so doesn't that mean that there wasn't actually a, a high school musical? This was, this was just high school callbacks. I mean, I guess we were watching the musical, but like if that's the case, you could name like half of the movies I've reviewed high school musical. Zombies and Descendants are both musicals about high schoolers. Okay, I'm losing track again. To be honest, I don't get the hype over this movie. This is probably Disney Channel's most profitable series and I honestly just think it's kind of okay. I get this is 2006, but oh God, is the music in this movie so 2006. Like, I know that's a weird thing to say, but I mean, it sounds so generic. Maybe at the time this was actually like God tier lyricism, but listening to this now feels like the music equivalent of trying to find a person in a sorority with an actual personality. A lot of these songs just aren't that interesting to me. Now I will admit, objectively, I'm probably just wrong, but I don't have any desire to give any of these songs a second listen. I'm gonna add some of them to the decon playlist just because I know some of y'all really like these and I feel like it'd be wrong not to add them, but overall, I don't have much of a desire to revisit this soundtrack. It's not bad, but nothing stands out to me as a stellar track, thematically or tonally. But all the singers do really good. My gripes are just more with the track production rather than the performance. I do also think the acting in this movie was a lot less wooden than I've come to expect in recent years. I feel like we've gotten to the point where the acting in Disney Channel movies is just big reaction equals good acting, and it's kind of gotten stale. 
This movie feels a lot more natural in its acting. I also think the characters are as fun as they are one dimensional. I would say that the most authentic character would be Gabriella. She doesn't take shit and I appreciate that. Other than that, oh boy, do I not have any real feelings about this movie. I even gave it a few days to let it rattle around in my head because it's not very often I watch a movie and just feel nothing. This movie was so incredibly average that scoring this thing is gonna be the easiest thing that I have ever done. For both the critical and the fun score, I'm gonna be giving it a six out of 10. It's not bad, but it is painfully average. I can't say I don't recommend it, but at the same time, I can't say I do. So I do have a little important thing to say. A couple weeks ago, I made some polls about which videos I had coming out in what order. As of recording this on September 19th, I intended to have the Avatar video come up after this one, but that is just not feasible anymore. Uh, I am still in the process of writing it. I already wrote the script for the main video, but I still need to do the intro and the outro. But the thing is, my script for the video is already 200 words longer than my Descendants 3 video, and I haven't even wrote the intro or outro. So realistically, this video is going to be like 40 to 45 minutes long, and I can't do that in a week. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to kind of move everything up a week, and then I will put this out maybe like end of November. I'm gonna be working on it in the background along with all these other videos as to not stress myself out too much. But other than that, I do wanna say thank you to my patrons once again. I'm gonna say this one more time and hopefully for the last time, but my Patreon is not something that I take lightly. I will only use money from my Patreon to support the channel, such as getting an actually good lighting setup, uh, renewing my contact subscription so I don't have lens glare all the time, and buying a camera and a camera stand because I record all of my videos on a copy of Chainsaw Man Mangos, chapter one through 11, the Marvel Encyclopedia, and the Art of Overwatch books. I'm not making that up. I'll, I'll put a picture on screen so you can see what it looks like. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna use the Patreon to support making higher quality content. You guys have no idea how finicky recording on my phone actually is. Uh, it stops recording like all the time. It's very annoying. I also wanna get a green screen uh, for when I make video essays. I feel like that'd be kind of funny. But yes, thank you so much to my patrons. Make sure you guys follow the socials. Also join the Discord. It is a very silly place where we do a lot of silly things. Uh, now I am going to go to sleep. There is no joke outro for this video. I am so goddamn tired. <laughs>